Great, thank you for that intro. That was pretty awesome. Prepare to be disappointed, everybody. <laughs> all right, so um, yeah, we're gonna talk about compliance and innovation, and hopefully you all be, will be able to use some of the stuff I talk about in your, in your jobs. Uh, that's me as proof. I'm here. That's what I look like. Um, I won't go over the intro very much. Uh, I, I'll just add that I also run uh, a nonprofit called 757 Color Coded down where I live in Chesapeake and uh, Hampton Roads. And there we, we try to get people of color into tech who want to break into tech. And we also create a space for those who are already in tech to kind of share their experiences. We center those people, but all are invited. So if you're ever in the 757 and we're having an event, come on out. All right, so uh, as engineering leaders, we are tasked with doing work that is secure, that is compliant, and innovative. And uh, the way we talk about that work matters. We want to make sure that we are creating the space for our teams to do that stuff. Um, and so we have to convince people often that, that we should be doing that work. And so if we're talking about it in a way that doesn't land with the audience that we're trying to hit, then we don't get the space to do what, we're, what we need to do. So uh, I want to talk about some of the ways that we can, we can better communicate the importance of compliance, the importance of security uh, in a way that will help us uh, convince those that, that we work with that it should be done. Uh, so generally, you don't have to sell people on innovation. People are on board with innovation. But uh, we should be talking about compliance in a way that people can understand that it is a way for us to get to innovation. To, it is a way for us to innovate. So how do we do that? I've heard people try uh, an approach like this, which is this statement is 100% true, uh, kind of talks about compliance as a way for us and what it's done to, to kind of have organizations take security uh, more seriously. This messaging might work for a more technical audience. Doesn't really work for people, maybe like your head of product or your CEO or your board. It isn't really speaking their language, right? But it's true. Uh, next, this is another attempt, right? So you're talking about fines, people care about money, so fines sometimes work. You're talking about your reputation. If, if you're talking to somebody in customer success, that might be convincing to them, but you're still not speaking a, a more kind of inclusive language that, that will get everybody kind of excited or at least um, thinking about why the work should be done. Even better here, we're talking about uh, compliance making our business more attractive. Now, this is, this is something that people uh, can, can get behind, right? We want to be, be able to differentiate ourselves in the market. We want to be able to, to tell people that we're better than our peers. And so talking about compliance in this way does, does, does work many times. And so if you can just talk about it in terms of dollars and cents, it'll help us close deals, right? And if you're talking about enterprise customers in particular, uh, I'm sure many of us know here that if you, if you want to do business with a bigger company, generally there's a vendor due diligence process, and in that process you have to provide some kind of an attestation or a report of compliance to show that you're taking security seriously, and without that you won't be able to close the deal in many cases, right? So, so this works. This works a lot. I've, I've used this, this uh, tactic in the past, and it's been successful. But like I said before, I think the best way to talk about this stuff is to, to, is to not pit the two against each other, but to say, we are going to innovate, but we're gonna do it in a secure way. We're gonna do it in a compliant way. The best way for us to move forward is to move forward with secure innovation. So I'm gonna talk about uh, how we can, we can do that. When you're talking to folks about this secure innovation or just in compliance in general, it's also important to frame the work not as uh, you know, a series of tasks that have to be completed. It's really, you wanna make sure that people understand this, this work is, doesn't have to be boring. It can be exciting, it can be um, a good time, really. It can be the kind of work that creates opportunities for people, creates leadership opportunities for people, right? So you wanna make sure that as you're talking about it, you're framing it in a way that isn't boring. State of DevOps support last year uh, highlighted a few different uh, practices within organizations that are high performing. And uh, the, the, the way you should start kind of talking about secure innovation is by building up a culture um, within your organization that, that prioritizes uh, security, compliance, and innovation. So how do you do that? First and foremost, you want to make sure that your, your culture is generative and it's built on trust. 
It's a place where you uh, share risk, you, you embrace ideas from other folks, um, and you're working together. And, and generally, when uh, what the report highlighted was that when organizations that do this perform 30% better than their, their counterparts, this is all in the, in the report. If you haven't read it, I definitely recommend go ahead and take a look at it. Knowledge sharing. Definitely important in terms of security and compliance. Definitely important in terms of productivity and, and delivery. Organizations that did this, so like we're talking about documentation and run books and things like that. Um, they were, uh, they saw 12.8 uh, really um, X uh, improvement in software delivery performance. I just rounded it up to 13 here. Uh, focusing on users, right? Making sure that you're getting feedback from your users and incorporating that into your processes. Users care about security. Your customers care about security and compliance. So focusing on that saw a 40% in increase uh, of, of in higher, perf higher performing organizations outperform their peers by 40% uh, there. And then on the other side of it, uh, there's this uh, concept of fair distribution of work. So you want to make sure that the people in, within your organization have opportunities to do uh, work that is important to them, work that is high visibility, high impact work. And so you want to create a formal process for actually making sure that that work is distributed equitably. And so without that, what we, what we saw in the report is that people that I identified as underrepresented or 24% more um, uh, uh, likely to report that they were burned out. So all of these things need to be considered as you're building this culture that prioritizes security, compliance, and, and innovation. This is a slide I used uh, in an all-hands meeting when I took over as uh, the uh, head of uh, information security. Uh, it's true, everybody's responsible for security and compliance. Everybody's got to do security awareness training. You've got to make sure your laptop is secure, all that stuff. So uh, it's really important to make sure that people understand this, right? While I, in that situation, was ultimately accountable, which meant I would get fired if things went wrong, uh, it's still everybody's responsibility to make sure they're doing what, what needs to happen uh, so that we can be compliant. To take it a step further, everyone's responsible for secure innovation, right? So everybody needs to work together to make sure that as we innovate, we're doing it in a secure way. I talked about opportunities for leadership. So uh, just consider that this might be you know, an org chart in an engineering organization. You might have security dedicated personnel. You might, uh, you, you, you might but uh, in this situation, uh, basically I was in a role uh, where I had engineers but didn't have security staff. And so what I decided to do was create this kind of set of responsibilities called a security champion. I've done this champion thing in a bunch of different context, but it, it worked pretty well here. So while it was a shared responsibility across the entire organization, um, there were people that would, I would kind of share the accountability with, for, for security and compliance with these people. And they would, you know, as they were working on things with their teams, they would make sure that, for instance, that uh, the data was secured, that we were considering how data that was in the scope for CCPA would, would be part of the request and, and um, deletion process, like all those things that we would need somebody to think about and kind of own for a team, they would take those on. And when it came to performance assessment time, uh, they were, we, we considered that they had done this additional set of work on top of their already, on top of the responsibilities they already had. And so this would help them progress in their careers, right? This was a formal way for people to get behind the work and, and to see it as important, right? It was part of their, their performance development. It was part of their performance assessment. And so they cared about it. it. It led to them getting promoted and getting raises and it was, it was pretty successful. So that's kind of the culture piece. Now we're gonna talk about processes, right? The processes kind of inform culture and vice versa, but uh, what, what's really important is that compliance needs to be not a, not a one-time thing. You don't scramble for getting things together when, the, when it's audit time. You want to make sure that compliance is, is business as usual. So how do you actually get that done? First and foremost, uh, you should be using some kind of an automated uh, a clients, a compliance automation uh, platform so you can monitor what's going on in your system. You can get data that lets you know where you are in your compliance journey. There are a lot of different players in this space. This is a screenshot from uh, Vanta. I use this with a, a couple different clients. And so you can decide on what compliance framework or regulation uh, you, you need to be compliant with and get, uh, uh, you know, 
real-time information about where you are, like what, what needs work, what doesn't need work, and you can use this to define what your strategy is going to be uh, throughout the year, right? So in this role that I was in, uh, Q2 we had of 2022, we had no idea what we, where we are. We didn't know, um, you know what our, our risk posture was. We didn't know anything. We just knew our audit is at the end of the year, so we need to get things together around September, start working with the auditor, and get ready for SOC 2. This is for a SOC 2 uh, audit. And so after going through that process for the end of the year, it took way longer than it should have. I was on a cruise uploading evidence into a, a portal. I said, I'm never doing this again. So uh, we actually, we, and we were using a compliance automation platform, but we weren't using it to the, the full extent. And so I, I spoke with the customer success folks and said, hey, how can we get this thing actually working for us? And so we did that, got it configured. And I use the information in there to actually set goals for our strategy in 2023. And so I said, by Q2 2023, we wanna be 60% of the way done with our compliance. By Q3, we wanna be 80% done. And so what this does is it elevates compliance work as a kind of like a first class citizen in your, in your goals. Um, it helps the company understand how important it is. It helps your, your organization understand how important it is. And it helps build space for this work into your everyday life. I'm sure you all have seen this diagram several times. Uh, you wanna shift security and appliance left or as early in the process as possible. A couple of different ways to, to go ahead and do that. First and foremost, uh, when you're having discussions about product development, whether it's a new feature, um, you wanna make sure that there is a section in, for instance, your PRD that allows you to ask and, and address questions related to security and compliance, right? If you're developing a feature that, uh, that requires people to put in some additional information, how are you going to process that information? Is it in scope for you know, different privacy regulations? And you wanna make sure that's addressed upfront so that you're not scrambling at the end of the, deployment, uh, the, the development process to get all this stuff taken care of. Categorization of work for when you're in sprints. So uh, this is something that I've applied in a bunch of different roles. I wanna make sure that your sprints are, are balanced. If you use sprints, some people don't. Um, but whatever process you use to define the work that's going to be done by your development team, you wanna make sure you're taking a balanced approach to, to doing that work. And so uh, what I've done is break it up into three different categories, your, your feature development, uh, your maintenance and support. So it's like bugs, keeping the lights on, and then your engineering and systems work. So that. You can be pretty flexible there. It might be upgrading a library. It could be refactoring something, a bunch of different things. You can really use this to your advantage if you want to make sure you're getting work into the sprint um, that's, that you want to do. So by default, you might say, all right, 60% of our sprint is going to be dedicated to feature development, 20% to maintenance, and 20% to engineering and systems. But you can change this mix depending on what's going on with your company, right? So if, for instance, there's a big push for retaining customers, you might want to focus more on addressing some of the bugs that exist. So you might say, we're going to do 40% maintenance work, 30% feature work, 30% engineering and systems. And so uh, this is just a way to make sure that you're always getting in some of the security and compliance work, which might fit into the engineering and systems or maintenance and support, depending on how you want to, um, to, to categorize it. But you're always doing this work. You're not pushing for, you know, we want to spend three months doing security and compliance work. You're saying, this is just going to be happening all the time. Then there are some things that are just kind of table stakes that, that you have to do um, if you want to be compliant with many of the, the, the frameworks and regulations that I talked about already. Um, access control, you've got to have some policies in place for access control. If you're, if you're in AWS, you want to have you know, your IAM set up um, correctly. You want to use a principle of least privilege, um, things like that. You've got to have a security baseline set up for your, your images so that uh, security concerns are addressed uh, as early as possible. Uh, obviously, you want to lock down your, your network and uh, use VPCs, private and public subnets, control communication between those things, have some data protection uh, stuff in place. You want to encrypt data in transit and uh, at rest and make sure you're using the right uh, encryption alg algorithms. A lot of this stuff is going to be dictated by which framework you're using. Uh, some kind of detection uh, processes in place so that you can figure out when there are things happening that shouldn't be happening. 
And then obviously you want to have an incident response and disaster recovery uh, plan as well. Have an on-call rotation, figure out what you're supposed to be doing with on-call. Um, if you're, it, I have a lot to say about on-call in general, but if you just listen to uh, Charity, then you can just do whatever she says. Um, <clears throat> pipelines, we have to talk about pipelines. It's a DevOps uh, conference. So, um, you should definitely make sure that you're building security into your delivery pipeline. Um, and that includes development, that not just the build, test, and deploy. As you're choosing languages and frameworks, you should be using, you should be using frameworks because they, generally they have some security controls built into them. Um, I guess you should be using memory, memory safe languages if you care about what the government says. Um, build, you should be uh, using static analysis tools. And there are a bunch of different players in this space as well. I've used SonarCube, it's been pretty great, but you wanna use that as you're, as you're building your code. Test, obviously you have to write automated tests and build in security tests and respect those tests. A lot of people, I've seen people, you know, use a library for testing and then just set everything to warn. They're just deploying a bunch of code that is not secure. Respect the tests, make them fail the build, do the work to, to correct them. Deploy to your non-production environments and then, you know, promote things to production as necessary. Use, uh, if using Terraform, use Sentinel to, to, to test policies and, and do that, that kind of stuff. And then obviously, Monitor, I've used Datadog in the past, so there are, again, a lot of players in this space as well, but you have to set up um, monitoring uh, performance to, to make sure that you understand what's going on with your application. So, uh, gotta bring all this stuff together, right? Uh, this might come in the form of a microservice, it might come in the form of one of your engineers saying, hey, I just wanna set up this Lambda function and make some calls to open API, what do you think? And you might think, well, you're just trying to get me fired, but that's not really the way to support innovation in your organization, right? So I'm gonna tell a quick uh, story based on something that actually happened where we were gonna build a microservice. So I laid out a vision for the engineering team. It included microservices, because that's what people wanted to build. And I said, all right, next year, we're gonna take all this stuff into consideration. We're going to build microservices. We're gonna use the Saga pattern and we're gonna do all this cool stuff, use databases, uh, uh, database per service where it makes sense, yada, yada, yada. And we're gonna do it next year because we're not ready to do it yet. And so uh, the business said, well, we need to create this AI powered feature, of course, they said that. And so one of the engineers who was a tech leader on the project said, this is a perfect candidate for our microservice. So uh, how did I respond? I might have wanted to say no, because we weren't ready. Uh, but again, if I want to be culturally, culturally aligned with secure innovation, I, I said, well, let's figure this out, how to do this. And it wasn't me necessarily figuring it out. I had some infrastructure engineers who were going to be working with this person. But I wanted to make space for us to actually work together and get this work done. That's, that's what we mean, or what I mean when I say everyone is responsible for secure innovation. We can't, we can't have security compliance work be a roadblock to us getting things done. We have to figure things out. We have to figure out how we can support um, new things that we want to do. So what did that mean for this work that the engineer needed to do? That meant working together with this person to figure out the success criteria for this, this new service, right? So um, if we were going to be doing this the ordinary way, it would take this this long, but we're doing it the microservices way. How long do we think it's going to take? And can we prove that this is a better way for us to get this done? Um, I also want to say experiments should have uh, controls and processes. Uh, I think a lot of times in software engineering, people think, well, I want to run an experiment. I can just do whatever I want, but that's not how it should go. Like you should figure out what does it look like for this thing to actually work? Like how do we know this experiment has been successful? And so we should push each other to make sure that we're thinking about things that way. So yeah, let's figure out success criteria together. Let's build the security baseline together for this new microservice. Let's uh, create the repository conventions because we wanna make sure that this thing is discoverable, that people know what it, what it means when they say, see this new repository. And as this work is being done, um, it doesn't really take all that long, but you need to remind everyone that's involved because they might think this is tedious or, or boring or getting in the way of them actually doing what they call the real work. You have to remind them this is the work and we're having a good time doing this work. 
um, figure out what telemetry we need, uh, you know, what do we need to do to, to, to measure things, and how do, where, where should those things be uh, uh, added into our, our system. Let's figure out the testing policy here. What are we going to test? How are we going to test? What are we going to be using to, to do our testing? So how are we going to build this thing? How are we going to release this thing? Uh, and then, obviously, how we're going to deploy this thing together. Right? All these things need to be figured out up front so that the work can be done the right way, and ultimately so that you can actually do this a lot faster in the future. Right? So the goal is to advance in, in our thinking and help everybody think differently about this stuff. So going from the no to let's figure out how to do this to, hey, Sure, you can, you can do this thing. Here's how we do that here, right? You wanna have as many different uh, avenues for people to innovate securely figured out so that you can do that work. You can, you can uh, support people getting things done securely and quickly um, without necessarily needing you to get involved. So uh, that is it, I'm done a little bit early, but uh, that's me again, that's my face. That is a safe QR code, that's just my LinkedIn. I'm not gonna be stealing anybody's information or anything like that. Um, if you see me, I'll be hanging around uh, until around noon today, so if you have any questions about any of this stuff, go, just go ahead and, and ask me, actually, till two, sorry. I'll be here for a bit. So yeah, uh, that's it, and uh, thank you for having me. <laughs>